Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Rose, and I'm the Global Director of Strategy for Checkmarks. I may know some of the people in the room, uh, but just want to introduce myself. And the topic of discussion for the next session is putting the SEC in DevOps. Uh, if you wanted to just uh, hang out and, uh, you know, Read your phone and things. I like these sessions to be interactive as possible. The reason being is you don't just come to listen to the speakers stand up here in a soapbox. You like to learn from the experiences of your peers. So I am going to ask questions. I may pick on you. I don't bite. I've had all my shots. So please, this is more interactive just for everybody's own education on the topic. So as a first step, I like to kind of take a query of the audience just on background. How many people in the room are software engineers actually writing code? A few. How many are security professionals, many different types of security? How many people are DevOps engineers? A couple. You're a half a DevOps engineer, so just the CI space, not, not DevOps. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is really delve into what putting the security in DevOps means. Um, I, I speak with a lot of uh, C-level executives from major companies, and it's an initiative for tons of organizations. But people get caught up in the minutia or the complication of acronyms and technologies, and they really don't think about effective ways to put security into a DevOps environment. Just again, another question for the audience. How many people have DevOps initiatives right now? In their organization? A couple. Does anybody feel like they're fully baked in their initiative, like their DevOps program is 100% baked, it's running on all cylinders? Nobody. Well, I, I didn't see anybody. Well, let's just say you are not different in that way. Most people are evolving their program. It's getting better, faster, more effective. But really, the tooling and the configuration is, is something that's constantly changing, is constantly evolving. So I give this talk to many different types of audiences. I give it to very technical audiences. I give it to DevOps audiences. I give it to security professionals. So there's a little bit of everything, a little bit of um, something for everybody in this deck. And please, ask questions. And the last kind of uh, caveat is you don't have to agree with me. I am not omnipotent. You have a different experience. You, have, you say, Matt, I have a different experience with that. I want to do it this way. That's great. That's what we're here for, to learn from each other, to learn from true experiences. So we're going to jump in unless somebody has a question to start. No? Not yet? Let's see if my clicker works. There we go. So some of these, I, I'm not trying to insult you uh, and with some of these uh, the slides. Again, I give these to very different audiences. So DevOps is really about the processes, connections, and automation of different disciplines. But really, it's about the tooling and how the tooling is integrated and automated, and I'm going to say that a bunch, into the process itself. And the overlap is really what DevOps is. But in terms of security, what does that mean? People talk about development, CI, CD. OK, where does security fit? What technology should I think about as I'm actually uh, um, architecting or creating my DevOps program? And what are some best practices around putting security into a DevOps program that is different than legacy structured programs that were more uh, effective in a waterfall type of environment, a, a, a code and test type of environment. So when you talk about these are the core security technologies when you're thinking about security and DevOps. Again, I'm not trying to insult anybody, and I'll give a little history on this slide. I spoke to a DevOps um, symposium, stood up there, started talking, started talking about the security technologies, and I got a couple hands. People are, uh, what is SAST? What is DAST? And I said, okay, we got to step back. So just to basically define some acronyms, these are the core security technologies you should think about when you're thinking about security and DevOps. And when I say DevOps, uh, associated with writing the code and testing the code at the different phases or disciplines of DevOps. So starting at the top, and I'll just go through these, I know everybody can read the slides, it's more about integrating and automating these type of technologies, and I'll explain where they go in a second. So static application security testing, testing the source code, scanning the source code at different points. I asked, how many people are familiar with I asked? One, maybe? So I asked is a newer technology. If you read anything about, from the industry analysts, it's a different version or a, I don't know how to put it, a modern version of dynamic testing in a little different kind of delivery mechanism. Uh, I'll get into the details of it in the next slide, but I asked really helps with leveraging an existing process which is your functional testing, your automated functional testing, to find another stream of data 
that you can use to remediate issues. Uh, how, if you read anything by Gartner or Forrester, IAST is a bleeding edge technology that is really something of interest and they're keeping their eye on because they feel it's going to definitely help in a very uh, fluid and evolving DevOps program. So if you haven't heard about it, maybe do a little research. IAST is a bunch of uh, different technologies out there and there's two different versions of IAST, but it's very interesting as part of automation integration into a DevOps program. DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, Many people are familiar with this, and it's an automated process for pen testing or automated testing of a running application. Um, it is a, a technology that's been around for a while, and it is complemented in a little different way uh, from IAST. You know, so IAST is more the, the newer version, and, and DAST is more of the uh, technology that's around. They all have their, their benefits, and their, you know, for some reason, uh, their issues, but they all work in together or should work in concert. Uh, how many people have heard of a runtime application self-protection or RASP? Not as many. So a RASP is basically a software-based firewall, a uh, web application firewall. It's something you bake into the product and then put it into production and it would have the same type of functionality as a web application firewall, which is an appliance on the line that's basically uh, looking at the packages and deciding whether it's a security risk or not or blocking or just monitoring, but it's actually part of the application. If you consider a, a relationship, IAS and RAS are both newer technologies and they kind of have the same DNA. They're just used in different arenas. One is used in the test arena, one is used in the production arena. Uh, I just mentioned web application firewall. It's a, a more of a, an older technology now. How many people are still using a WAF in their organization? Many? Any? A couple? Yeah, a couple. It still serves a purpose, but it is not as that slide. So the DevOps building blocks. Really, when you think about DevOps, there's really four main areas. You have the development arena, the CI arena, which is continuous integration. You have the CD arena, which I'm going to save. You have two definitions. Anybody know the two definitions of CD? Just shout it out if you know one of them. What does CD mean? Continue. Continue. What was that? We got it right here. Continuous deployment, continuous delivery. And I'm going to, I have a slide that actually defines it too, but sometimes people use CD in, in a couple different ways. So you gotta make sure that when you're talking about CD, what, what continuous delivery or continuous deployment. So, okay, these are the building blocks. Pretty, pretty boilerplate, pretty simplistic. Okay, those security technologies I just talked about, where do they slot? Where should I think about integrating and automating those security technologies at the different disciplines of DevOps? I keep hitting the wrong slide, there we go. So when you look at the security technologies, static analysis, scanning the uh, source code, in a developer's native environment, being the IDE, that is in the development arena. Usually those are full scans or sometimes incremental scans, I'll get into that in a second, but you're shifting left at this point, and I'm gonna talk about shifting left in a second. Uh, so the de development arena is static analysis integrated into um, your IDE or your native environment. CI is really where the rubber hits the road. Um, based on the kind of, the demands and the uh, timeframes associated with DevOps, a new version, kind of like IAST and, and RASP, uh, and web application firewalls and dynamic application security testing have come to the forefront and the differentiations between the, uh, the different technologies. Full scans don't, are not gonna work from a static analysis standpoint in a DevOps environment. They take too long, they're too cumbersome. So as you automate into your CI process, incremental scanning is key. You don't wanna have to rescan everything if you're only changing one microservice or 15 lines of code. You wanna basically be responsive to the process itself. And one of the biggest things I say is, when you have security technologies, <laughs> security technologies, no matter what they are, have to complement the DevOps process, not change or have special requirements or special things that need to be done to account for security, because the assembly line or the machine or the process that is automated or continuous can't be broken for security. It has to, security has to complement it in a way that allows the program to still work. As you move into the CD arena, the continuous delivery, continuous deployment, that's where IAS, DAST, and manual pen tests come in. So you've built the product with CI, the CI orchestration layer, um, and you've actually deployed it now for the testing, be it functional testing or security testing with these type of technologies. And then when you move into the production arena, that's where you know, the WAF and the RAS come into play. Any questions, any, any comments on any of these technologies and where they slot? 
How many people are using some of these technologies today? Bunch of hands, okay. How many people plan to implement some more of these technologies in the not too distant future? Yeah, which technology are you planning on rolling out? Hmm? Okay, no, fair enough. So as we talk about the program and what it, uh, I keep hitting the wrong button. One of the biggest things when you're talking about DevOps is the term agile. How many people use the term agile as on a daily basis? And the, the thing I like to clarify is people say, oh, we, we do agile DevOps. We definitely do agile DevOps. Are you agile verb or agile noun? And they kind of look at me sideways. It's a different meaning. So Agile Noun is the software development methodology of Agile. There's a bunch of different methodologies, but typically it's some form of an Agile-based software development methodology. That is under the development discipline. So if you say, I'm, I'm doing, uh, my, pro, my organization has an Agile DevOps program, it's kind of like saying engine car. It's, it's a component of a greater thing. So what, what do you actually mean? So Agile Noun is a software development methodology, but I'm agile, I'm very flexible. I can do a backbend. I really can't, but uh, are you responsive to change? Are you agile in terms of responsive to customer demands or, or feature changes, things like that? So when you're talking about DevOps and someone says agile, ask them the question what they actually mean by that. Are you talking about the software development methodology or the ability for the program to be um, responsive to change or, or, or feature requests or things like that? Any questions up to this point? So this is the developer process, a very simplistic example. It's not you know, robust or, or all-encompassing of everything. But when you talk about the developer's process, you're checking out from SEM, which is source code management systems. You're developing in your native IDE environment, Eclipse, IntelliJ, Visual Studio. You're compiling with a build environment. And the build environment is basically controlled by the CI orchestration. And really what CI is doing is it's the conductor. You say CI orchestration, I like to give an analogy. CI is really the conductor of the symphony orchestra. It basically points at the appropriate musical instrument to come in at the right time during the concert. You know, the wind section, the brass section, the string section. It's doing the exact same thing from a assembling your software or your 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle where it points at the source code to compile it with the correct build environment, with the binary repositories, with the open source repositories, it's putting together that puzzle. And that's, de that's uh, depicted here, and then you go into the test process. The thing is, I'm not, a I'm not a big fan of this slide. Anybody wanna give a guess why I don't like this slide? Well, this is just a development process, so there's, I agree, there's no security, which is a bad thing, but, it's linear. It reads like a sentence. When a DevOps environment exists, uh, you know, you go Google SDLC or process. It, it's linear like this. That really connotates a beginning and an end. I checked out code, I developed, I compiled, I tested. Is that code done? It, it's an infinity loop. It's constantly evolving. So th this is like a sentence. It you know, starts with a capital, ends with a period. I went to the store. Okay, you're at the store. You build software, as soon as that releases out, especially in a DevOps environment with microservices and everything that's happening these days, the next build is coming right down the tracks behind it. I deal with customers that are doing thousands of builds a day. So it's not a sentence, it's an infinite loop or a bow tie. So when you think about that, this is a simplistic process, but the process is much more, I'll use the verb version of the term I just mentioned, much more agile, much more flexible. So what is continuous integration all about? CI is the process of integrating code into a mainline code base. Implementing CI is all about the tooling. It's the conductor of the symphony orchestra. It's pulling the pieces together. It's scheduling things based on a certain set of requirements, whether it's a code check-in, whether it's a branch of your uh, code stream. There's many different things, but CI is the one that basically controls the whole process and fuels the assembly line. And really what DevOps is, it's a, it's a continuous assembly line to build your software and push it to production as quickly as possible with an eye towards 
changes by customer demands or features or things like that. Everybody can read this, but there's two words that are highlighted on this slide. I'm not going to read the slide because I know everybody can read it. The biggest things when you think about it are it's continuous and it's automated. So I always say integrated and automated. Integrated is the hooks of CI into the technologies and automation is exactly that, the automation or the process that allows it to be constantly scheduled, constantly running by a set of criteria because DevOps is so fluid that you can't have manual steps. No or manual process or, or, or software development processes, things, yes, you're writing code, the code can't be automated, but the building of the code, the, the, the factoring of the code, the assembling of the code is automated based on uh, kind of the parameters and settings of your CI uh, orchestration. So here's the definition. We said continuous deployment, continuous, de uh, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. The goal is for automation all the way through. Most organizations, and I'll just query the, everybody in a second, most organizations are currently at a DevOps stage of continuous delivery where it's automated all the way through to that deployment production. That's still a barrier to entry. It's still too complicated to automatically deploy to production every time I do a build. The goal of most programs, and goal, I say air quotes, goal, is continuous deployment where you're automated all the way through to deployment, but there are certain things that people are afraid of that. It, it's not something that is, is totally understood and it's still evolving. I've had organizations say, we'll never be continuous deployment. Reason being is we have checks that we have to do that are manual. So, but, you know, again, ask the question when you're talking as security professionals to your DevOps team, ask them if their aim is continuous delivery or continuous deployment. Ask what they mean by the CI orchestration, how they're doing it. Because you can leverage a lot of those things into the DevOps engineers in your organization the security technologies don't have to be treated as this big, scary monster. That's one of the things is you, I'm not even a proponent. I talked to the CISOs of major companies. They don't like the term DevSecOps. Anybody want to know why? Anyone want to take a guess? Again, I don't bite. Because it puts a security slant. It basically insinuates that DevSecOps is different than DevOps. That it's, you have to do different things for security. The security technologies are just another tooling aspect of the DevOps program that can be integrated and automated. So when you're talking to the DevOps engineers or architects as they're configuring their CI orchestration layer, you basically just say, it doesn't matter if it's a binary repository or a, a build environment or a, a open source repository, the security technologies are just another piece of technology that can be part of the process. You don't have to worry about fixing the results or remediating the results. Just automate it and integrate it into the process and everybody will be happy because manual processes are then going away. Any questions, comments up to this point? So the further the project is on the DevOps scale, the further right, the further left you should start implementing security checks. I do agree with this slide, but I want to put a caveat in. How many people use the term shift left? You know, shift security left. We have a couple. When you're in a DevOps environment, where's left? Let's go. Where is left on this slide? It's an infinity loop. How many people, when they have a new piece of software to write or a new feature release, they start from zero? Shifting left means fixing the vulnerabilities and automating the, the communication of security issues for remediation as part of this infinity loop. The best way I feel from a practical standpoint is de use, using, and it's depicted here on the bottom with JIRA, is pushing defects to developers through a normal process. Not a different process, not a big scary security process, but automating the process as much as possible to push security vulnerabilities through a normal mediation. This entire ecosystem with the security information to drive to one thing, not just identification, but remediation of the issues. And if you're shifting left, nobody starts, sits down like they're writing a letter to mom and opens up a word and said, hey mom, how you doing? Software is a copy of a copy of a copy. 
you're branching an existing code base, or you're creating a new piece of code that's joining a code base. So shifting left, yes, you can remediate issues early, but the other problem is how many people have, the, how many software engineers in the room, I'll, I'll query the guy, everyone in the room, how many people have the entire code base on the machine all the time? You, ha you download a, you do a pull from your source code repository, you have a component of code, you have the UI tier, you have the database tier, the business logic tier. That's all put together at, at, at the build time, at the CI orchestration layer. So thinking about left, you have to actually remediate left, but certification point to fuel the program is in the middle at the build phase. Questions, comments, anybody have any thoughts on that, disagree, share practical experiences? You guys are quiet, I got you right after lunch, so everybody's full and tired. So in a full nightly build, this is, you know, thinking about the insertion point, again, it's linear, so I'm not a big proponent, but this is the way the slide's been written, is the CI and the, the CD, the continuous delivery deployment, at the compile and test phase, that's where the incremental SAS and open source analysis come into play in an automated fashion. That's the best place to insert this because, again, it's leveraging an existing process. You know, to kind of beat home the point, you don't want to change process to account for security. You want to leverage what's there. Dependency checks and uh, I asked I, uh, and DAST and manual pen test happening at the end of the end test, at the end of the uh, continuous delivery deployment process. Again, a different representation, but more thought as you're moving through your process about where to insert the security technologies and capabilities. Okay, great. We've inserted security in an automated, integrated fashion. Everything's chugging along. How many people think it's a good idea to break the build if there's security issues? Agree and disagree. Reason being is you don't want to be the boy who cried wolf. Again, we're removing, we're calling it DevOps, not DevSecOps. We're just part of the process. We're not a security process. We're not, we're not scaring them with security. We're integrating into the process. There's always going to be risk. So breaking the build whenever there's a security issue is going to be cumbersome. There's going to be a subjective nature to that where, okay, is that a real issue? Do we have a compensating control? How do we get by this? So really, Breaking the build, you have to be 100% accurate or 100% vetted in your decision to break the build. Typically, I like to say if something has gone off the rails, break the build. We were at a pretty, st you know, let's give an example. We were at a pretty stable aspect with a very low number of issues, and all of a sudden the issue goes up by 40% from one build to the next. Okay, something has happened there, break the build or a new vulnerability that you can't live with in a production app has existed, break the build. One of the better ways to handle this, to allow for the process to still continue, but to allow you for that investigation time is to mark builds as unstable based on security risk. That works much better and doesn't create pushback or headaches for the process. It's a case-by-case -case basis. There's no right or wrong answer, but you know, the knee-jerk reaction is, we have security issues, break the build, don't go to production. Well, that may stop the train in its tracks. So just be cognizant of when you actually cry wolf that you're not actually being annoying or overly pestering in terms of your process. Because again, you, wanna, you don't want to break the process, you want to uh, complement it. So really be cognizant of breaking the build based on security risk. Marking the build as unstable is a better way, in my opinion, unless something really changes. Is there a question or just, no, just stretching? Okay. Is there any questions? Anybody have experience with breaking the bill for security issues or? I think quick note on why I lift my hand. Build was more of building the image or uh, artifact to put production. I would always break that if there is a critical security issue. Gotcha. Absolutely, that's a great example of how, you know, there's different ways to approach it where, again, you don't want to be overly 
uh, combative with the process. You want to basically have your ducks in a line before you actually start to cry wolf. Thank you for that. So, it, you know, in an example, if you have 365 developers, wow, that's magically the number of days in a year, and everyone only breaks the build once, you'd have a build break a day, which would be very, very uh, problematic for uh, releasing software on time and meeting the project management's uh, requirements. So, I apologize for any bad words, just uh, some, a little bit of humor for the conversation about breaking the build is a sensitive issue. I was a software engineer for many years, and if you broke the build, everybody was looking at you. So, just a little bit of humor for the, uh, for the afternoon about breaking the build. And again, sorry if there's any colorful words that offend people. So one of the biggest things, okay, we've talked about integrating and automating. We've talked about insertion at the CI orchestration layer. What's another issue with that? It's what you look for, especially in a DevOps environment. Again, you don't want to be the boy who cried wolf with breaking the build for every time there's a security issue, but you also don't want to be too broad in terms of what you're looking for. So you need to have a security policy that maps to your risk and then evolve that policy over time. How many people have a security policy for vulnerabilities in the software developing? How often is that reviewed? That's, that's the exact point, where the security issues are constantly evolving, so your policy. I have a funny story where I was talking to somebody and uh, they said, well, we're gonna in institute our corporate-wide um, static application security testing policy. I said, oh, that's great. What is it? Well, it's, you know, it's very, it's very good. Everybody likes it. I said, when was that created? And they looked at each other and, well, we, it was created like four years ago. Um, we had this architect named Steve. He was fantastic. But he's left the company, but he wrote a really good policy, so we just stick with it. I would suggest that a policy has to be very pointed for the vulnerabilities you're concerned about. And the magic number is five to 10 types of issues that you need to look for, baseline those issues, feel comfortable that you're actually remediating those issues and they're at a, a very um, stable rate, and then turn the dials up. Don't look for everything. That's one of the biggest issues organizations have with any security technology is they buy the, the latest, greatest security technology, be it static analysis, dynamic analysis, anything. They turn everything on. And all of a sudden there's way too much information. There's not enough time in the day. And again, you're getting pushback. There's too much information. You start to get into a subjective conversation. Create a policy that maps to your risk, baseline the applications, and then turn the dials up. And these policies, in my opinion, should be reviewed based on what's happening in the industry or industry trends on at least a quarterly basis to account for changes in open source issues, changes in new frameworks, new versions of languages. It's all new risk. So if you're only looking for things that were important or bleeding edge three years ago, you're not looking for the things that are potentially dangerous today. And the policy has to evolve based on vulnerability type and age. You know, you're not, it's not practical. There's only so much time and resources available in a day. Give a set, if this is a SEV1 issue or priority one issue, you have four days to fix it. I'm just throwing out a number. That may be different from organization or group to group. SEV2, you have two weeks. SEV3, you have two months. But that has to evolve, and you have to basically do a check on those vulnerabilities about, in terms of aging, whether they've been addressed and have they been addressed based on the SLA of when you're supposed to fix it. One of the other policies you have to have is open source. Not only the code you're writing, but the open source packages you're using from an accepted list, a whitelist, blacklist scenario, and just a overall investigation to say, is that open source package in my code base? It doesn't, you know, you may have a policy, but somebody may sneak in the back door an open source package just to save a little bit of time. Make sure that you're finding those open source packages and have a, have a policy in place for A, updating the packages if there are issues and what you're going to do if you find something that is not approved within your code base. Sure. Mm -hmm. Especially because they demand having open internet access, they'll bring it down. And then when they put it in, it becomes legacy. I mean, it almost has no development support after a certain amount of time. Is there a way to sell, the best way to sell a development management on how to keep their open source libraries tight? Does that make sense? 
do, how do, do I get them to invest in their own libraries? It's a question of just like patching, you know, an endpoint or something like that. If you could answer that question too, that'd be great. <laughs> well, that, that's a that's a twofold question. So. Thinking about the risk, I'd be very communicative on what open source vulnerabilities, because most of the breaches that are in the press today have an open source component associated with it. And a lot of times, it's associated with somebody just putting something in the code and setting and forgetting it, never updating it, never getting up to the latest version. There are ways to communicate, and one of the biggest things is inheritance. So it's not just the package called foo. Foo inherits from three levels down, and there may be a vulnerability in three levels down. So I would suggest that you statically scan applications looking for those naming conventions or anything that is potentially open source and saying these aren't approved and having a clearly communicated whitelist, blacklist scenario associated with your open source packages. That's the easiest way. These are the ones you can have in the code. If I found one of these, and I understand, it's in, well, that's been in the code, the application for two years. Well, it's insecure. You haven't updated it. It's three versions, 10 versions ahead, whatever it is. Now we're open, it's nothing that you've done, you've done the right thing with your code, but that open source package that you did as a shortcut or as a convenience is causing you problems. So do you communicate a, a whitelist, blacklist scenario of like, you know, or more of a whitelist? These are the ones that are allowed, everything else isn't allowed. They're, they're not accepting of that, they just? No, it's more on a case by case basis. Right? Is it really? I mean, open source, there's a lot of technologies out there my company has a technology, a lot of technologies out there, to scan the open source package just to show them. And, and that might be the best way to do it is find out what they're using, scan them with an open source scanning solution, and point to all the vulnerabilities in those packages and say, you put this in there, this is now on you because you know about it. Yeah. It's a little bit of a shock and awe approach, but sometimes you have to be led to water to, to really understand it. So moving on, I know we're probably, you know, where does security clash with key DevOps requirements? The biggest areas are speed. Legacy full code scans, no matter what technology is, take too long. They don't fit with the agile verb uh, thinking associated with DevOps. So you need to have the capability of incremental scans or scans that complement the process itself. And the other thing is, again, we don't want security to be this big, scary thing. So if you say this is a security scan, you have all these special requirements to account for security scan, that's gonna have an issue. You have to be complementary to the process, so speed and processes that are out of band are a detriment to DevOps initiatives. And the other thing is, again, don't be the boy who cried wolf or too alarmist, stability is a huge issue. If there's always going to be security risk, it's impact and likelihood are the two things you gotta look at. How bad is this from an impact standpoint? What is the likelihood it would happen? You have to take those into account when you're actually breaking a build or marking a build as unstable. Any questions up to this point? Sure, where was it? So we have how security is clashing. This is more of a your opinion question. Um, you look at the DevOps handbook. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, and in practicality state, that should be the way. Yeah. I speak at DevOps conferences, and I'll talk to the architects, and I throw out there to the DevOps architects, how many people are talking to security? Yeah. A bunch of blank stares. Well, we don't talk to them. They do their own thing. It's trying to bring these conversations together, and the reason why I give this talk is you guys are in the seat of influencing these processes. They're still evolving, and you know, call it DevOps, call it DevSecOps, you want to make sure security is part of the process. You can call it whatever you want, but it really doesn't have to be a side process or not a banned process. It's just another piece of technology that's automated as part of DevOps. So when you actually, it doesn't matter if you're using whatever uh, build environment you're using that are orchestrated by CI, security can piggyback on that process. It's just kind of to, to level the playing field and really 
equal security as much as the other processes that are just part of building the software. And, and, and the, the reason why I talk about that is because a CISO basically sat with me, I was having dinner with him, and, he, and I said, DevSecOps, he said, Matt, don't say that. He's like, that's the bane of my existence. And this is you know, a Fortune 10 company. He said, I, no, security is part of DevOps. It's going to be part of DevOps. I don't want to call it out, because then they insinuate that you know, DevOps is different than DevSecOps. No, security should be part of DevOps. I'll repeat it, security should be part of DevOps. It's just sometimes you have to call it out to really beat the point home. But again, then it gives a, a different light on it. Does that make sense? And really, how many people in the security arena in this room, because a lot of you raised your hand, how many people have a relationship or have reached out to your DevOps engineers or architects? A few of you? How many feel they should, but they really haven't had the time or they don't want to talk to you? That, that does happen. Be part of the process. Don't be a side process. Don't be a, afraid of the, because you have one opportunity to make a first impression. So you want to be part of while the DevOps program is evolving to put security in it. So the summary, develop security policy that fits DevOps flow. Don't change it for security. Be part of it. Again, it's DevOps. Security should be part of DevOps. The DevOps handbook says it should be, but sometimes it's forgotten. Sometimes it's a side process and is bolted on after, which is a headache for everybody. Shift security left and right, or, as, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Like one of the biggest issues I've seen in, in, in DevOps is sharing secrets around. I have, so far I haven't seen a good tool that will let you do that seamless across the That's why it's still evolving. Players new technologies that are helping streamline the process. And you know that drive from continuous delivery and deployment aspect, one of those things is people aren't constantly pushing to production automated fashion because A, the tooling's there or the comfort level's not there yet. Again, this is something that's evolving. Everybody has initiatives and I was actually speaking at an Air Force show and a captain, very senior in the cybersecurity ranks within the Air Force and I said only about 5% feel they're fully baked in their DevOps initiatives. He raised his hand and he said, and they're full of bleep. Nobody's fully baked, he said. The Air Force isn't fully baked. It's constantly evolving and you have to stay ahead of it to make sure that you're up to date with the tooling and you're up to date with the technologies that that tooling is implementing. Absolutely. Great point. Shift security left and right. Security needs to be at every phase. We, we mapped out the disciplines of DevOps. You have to have security technologies. They're different types of technologies and they slot themselves differently based on kind of the activities that are done during, in those disciplines. But make sure security is at every stage, not at the end, not at the beginning, not at the middle, but at every phase of your DevOps program with different types of technologies in terms of security identifying risk. And the biggest thing is if you're not looking at your open source packages or scanning your open source packages or have an open source package policy, you need to. Open source is here, it's not going away, and it's just becoming more and more part of the ecosystem of your software. So if you just have a security policy for OWASP top 10, which is security types, you need to actually expand that out or have a separate policy mapping to the open source packages that you're using as part of your day to day. That's all I had for today. Any, any questions? I'll be here for a little bit, but anyone have any questions? You feel free to find me or enjoy the rest of the conference. Relate to open source packages, open source registries. Mm -hmm. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Bringing them down, then you have control of them, but you have to make sure you update them. Because once they're pulled down, they're, they're frozen in time. If there's an update that happens two days after you bring it down, you don't get the benefits of that. Or one of the packages that have been inherited by the open source package, if you don't get the benefit of that. So you have to have a process that does a check and balance very often if you bring it into your own. If you're doing a mirror, Okay, you're getting the latest updates, but again, you're not in total control, and you may get a bad open source package. The latest version may be worse than the previous version. So it's a very delicate balance about how you approach that. 
and scanning and vetting is on a, on a continuous basis as part of CI helps with that because it's basically looking at those open source packages on a predetermined schedule that is very, very effective. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Sense, but different tax transfers, different there are more secure languages than others, uh, just by their true nature, but the problem is you're, you're forgetting the human element. Sure. So this may be the most secure language in the world, but if it's implemented incorrectly, not based on the standard or the requirements, it could be insecure. So you may have a false sense of security. So I would treat everything equal. I mean, I would make sure that, you know, oh, this is the most secure language, whether it's the new JavaScript framework or whatever it is, one of the modern Go or something like that that everyone says, oh, it's so secure. But the human factor comes in. And if it's misconfigured from a configuration standpoint, from a data validation standpoint, you're not using the correct data validators for that language, the human element could be a false sense of security for something that you feel is, is a secure language. Oh, we don't have to worry about that. That's the most secure language ever. So just, you, you can't control the human element. That's why you have to be very, very diligent in terms of your testing and ongoing testing. Does that make sense? No, it does. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Have a rest of your conference, a uh, good rest of your conference, and a good rest of the week and upcoming weekend. Thank you.